Hi everybody, it's Mr. Matthew again, and in this theme we're going to talk about scientific inquiry. Uh, in this video I will talk a little bit about the differences between discovery science and hypothesis driven science. Uh, we'll also have a discussion about um, how to set up an experiment and experimental design. So we'll talk a little bit about positive and negative controls. I'll also do a little discussion about independent variables versus dependent variables. And then lastly a little bit about data interpretation. And then we'll close with a discussion of distinguishing science from pseudoscience, and I'll give an example. Uh, we'll do much, much more of that in class, obviously, but um, we will get started here. All right. So let's start by talking about discovery science and hypothesis-driven science. So when we talk about discovery science, what we're looking for is we're looking at the idea of going out and just collecting information. So uh, in the textbook, they describe, you know, the work of Jane Goodall going out and observing uh, silverback gorillas. Um, over here on the far left, I also have a diagram of penicillin uh, or penicillium mold, which led to the discovery of penicillin. And so in this instance, this was a discovery not based off of a planned experiment, but Alexander Fleming discovered that there was mold growing on a petri dish and it was inhibiting the growth of bacteria near that location. And so this was a discovery. It wasn't set out where he was looking um, and had an idea about what might possibly occur, but it was a careful uh, set of observations made um, that led to further discovery. Oftentimes, discovery science will lead to further study and deeper hypothesis driven work. So over on the right hand side, what we see is this um, cycle that uh, describes the scientific method. Now I'm always a little leery of any diagram of the scientific method because the scientific method is not necessarily a linear process that scientists go through. It's not like as a scientist I'm at the lab bench and I pull out my card and says, ah, what's my next step in the scientific method? But in fact, Scientific uh, discovery, which is based off of observation, is one of the fields that fits into hypothesis-driven science. So let's kind of go around. And I'm going to start by that, that opening box in the top, which is called making observations. I go out and what do I see in nature? Um, this could be um, from my own experience, or I may read something. I may discover something that somebody else has observed. And from that, I'm going to brainstorm. I'm going to think about interesting questions that arise from this. Uh, these could be, you know, what might cause this or how is th this topic related to another topic? And based off of the initial data and the, the questions that I come up with, I'm going to formulate a hypothesis. This is going to be a tentative explanation for the phenomenon, a tentative connection. And then I'm going to develop a testable prediction. And so this is a really important aspect of, of um, scientific inquiry is that having an idea about something is not enough. You must be able to test that. And as a result of that test, I'm going to then design um, an experiment or a means of collecting further data about this. And so I'm going to go gather data based off that test of prediction. This is going to lead to a couple of different things. One, I could then rethink what I thought about that initial hypothesis, then have to go to refine and alter and expand or reject my hypothesis. Maybe I came up with a very simple explanation and it wasn't nuanced enough. It wasn't a full enough explanation of what was going on. And so now I have to go back and refine. Maybe I was completely wrong. Maybe I, what I thought was initially going to happen isn't supported at all. And now I need to say, wait, no, I got to go a whole different direction. But the idea here is that the testable prediction must actually be able to be shown to be false. That is actually a key component about this. If I have developed a testable prediction, I gather data, it supports, this may lead into the development of a, a generalized theory. Now, the term theory in science is a big important term because it unifies a broad collection of observations and phenomena. A theory is not the common usage of the word theory, um, which is sometimes thrown around in everyday English, like just an idea. In science, the word theory has a great deal of weight, and it is a unifying collection of data and observations. The other component about theories is that theories are alterable. If a, something comes along and it challenges a component of a theory, um, or in fact completely uproots it, um, the scientific community will come together and they will refine that theory. So theories are built on a strong foundation and they are alterable if new, um, really strong data comes along and challenges that idea. 
All right, so let's take a look at an example of an experiment, and this is actually an experiment we will do in this particular unit, or related to an experiment that we'll do. And this is what we're calling a catalase experiment. Catalase is an enzyme. Um, it's found in liver. Uh, it's found in a lot of places, but it's in high concentration in liver. So if we were to get some animal liver and we were to put it at the bottom of a uh, test tube, and in those test tubes, I am going to add hydrogen peroxide. And so what we see is in test tube one, I have a liver chunk and I have some hydrogen peroxide and I see oxygen gas being given off. In the second tube, in addition to my hydrogen peroxide and my liver, I have also put in a strong acid. And in this case, I don't see any oxygen bubbles. In my third experiment, um, I or my third setup, I see that this is a weakly acidic solution. And again, I have hydrogen peroxide liver and I have a little bit of bubbles coming up um, in that weakly acidic solution. And then the next, in number four, I have a strongly basic solution. And again, I have liver, hydrogen peroxide, and a strong base, and I see no oxygen gas given off. And in the last, or test tube five, I have a uh, weakly basic solution mixed in with my hydrogen peroxide liver, and I see a few oxygen bubbles being released. So the first question I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to do a, a series of pause and thinks here. And the first question is going to be, is there an experimental control in here? And by that, I mean, is there a positive or negative control to this experiment? Pause and think. Okay, so hopefully what you came up with is that there is in fact a positive control for this experiment. And that positive control is test tube one. And what test tube one is showing me normal conditions, and it's a proof that the liver and the hydrogen peroxide are actually good materials and they work in this experiment. This is serving as a positive control showing normal conditions. I don't in fact have a negative control. So for example, I don't have um, what happens when I don't, when I mix just any liquid with a uh, liver, maybe I was to set up a different test tube and I could maybe label test tube six. And what I would do is I would put liver and instead of putting um, hydrogen peroxide, I put water in there and see, does it, well, does it bubble if it's just a regular neutral solution? Does liver give off bubbles? That could serve as a negative control. I could also um, have hydrogen peroxide instead of liver, um, just drop something of um, similar mass or consistency. Maybe I could drop a piece of Play-Doh in there, which should be an inert substance and see, does that in fact uh, give off bubbles? So does mixing hydrogen peroxide with any chunk that in neutral solution, does that lead to bubbling? That could also serve as a negative control. Okay. All right. So our second pause and think is going to be, what are the independent and dependent variables in this experiment? So pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you came up with is that the independent variable is the thing that I, as the experimenter, is, are changing in this. So this case, the thing that I'm changing is the acidity or um, alkalinity, the, how acidic or basic the solution is that I am mixing in with my liver and hydrogen peroxide. So what you'll notice here is that I have strongly acidic, weakly acidic, strongly basic, and weakly basic. Those are my independent variables. And obviously in my positive control, I have a neutral solution. So the pH or how acidic or basic the solution is, is my independent variable. And the dependent variable, the thing that happens based off of the changing of those conditions is going to be the production of oxygen gas, where I have a lot of oxygen gas being given off in the neutral solution, no oxygen gas being given off in the strongly acidic and strongly basic, and then um, small amounts of gas in the weakly acidic and weakly basic solution. Okay, now here's my um, last pause and think. What scientific claim could you make based off of this data? Pause and think. All right, so hopefully you came to the idea that the pH of catalase or the pH of the liver has an impact on how reactive that enzyme is. Now, that's a fairly, you know, 
simple solution. Maybe you came up with something like that um, the the enzyme in the liver reacts best at a neutral solution. That would also be fair. Or that strongly acidic and strongly um, basic solutions um, somehow inactivate enzymes. These are all reasonable claims. The key with making a scientific claim is it's a, an explanation that's driven by the data. And so by making those observations, I am able to take a combination of the observations and the setup, and I am able to make an explanation for what I have seen here. We'll do a lot more of this in class. All right, so we're going to finish up with the idea of distinguishing science from pseudoscience. And in this case, um, I'm going to give you a specific example, and that is the Bermuda Triangle. So let me give you a uh, an article or a clip that I, f I found that describes what the Bermuda Triangle. So as early as 1952, an abnormal number of accidents seemed to occur in the triangular region with Bermuda, uh, Miami, Sa and San Juan, Puerto Rico as its corners. Many strange shipwrecks and plane crashes have supposedly happened in the Bermuda Triangle, often in calm weather. These are sometimes associated with bizarre happenings like spinning compasses, lights in the sky, or crews that, and passengers that inexorably vanish from the vessel. So what I want you to take a minute is I want you to pause and think. And based solely on the information I've given you, is the claim that there's this Bermuda Triangle where ships and planes magically disappear, would you consider that a scientific claim or a pseudoscientific claim? Pause and think. All right, so this is a bit of a trick because, you know, I've given you just a little bit of data I haven't given you there, but hopefully you lent, led yourself towards the idea that the Bermuda Triangle leans itself to a pseudoscientific um, claim as opposed to a scientific claim. So let's talk about what is science. Well, science, again, willingness to change with new evidence. Here I've only given you a single piece of evidence. If somebody was to make the claim that the Bermuda Triangle is where all these things disappear, you would then have to ask the question, all right, what's the data in there? And my question is, is if somebody strongly believes in the Bermuda Triangle, is there any evidence that could change their mind about the fact that the Bermuda Triangle is in fact this place where ships disappear? And if the idea is that no, there's no evidence that you could present, then that would be a pseudoscientific idea. Uh, ruthless peer review versus no peer review. Has there any been any review of this material? Well, based off what I've given you, the answer is no. Um, I haven't shown you any review. There have been reviews, and the question will be, well, what does that review say about the Bermuda Triangle? Takes account all new discoveries versus selects only favorable discoveries. Here we've been very selective. Many strange shipwrecks and plane crashes. You'll notice that many... Um, so using this anecdotal data is probably going to be a good hint that it is a pseudoscientific claim. Does this invite any um, uh, criticism or does the, does, would any criticism seen, be seen as conspiracy? Is it non-repeatable results? Are there any way that we could find out if those ships in the past had spinning compasses, if there were lights in the sky? Um, you know, these are, are these, these, are these repeatable? Um, is there usefulness in this claim? Is the fact that there is this triangle where things disappear, does it have any widespread usefulness? Um, are there specific accurate measurements um, versus ballpark measurements? This last piece, along with looking back at the um, favorable discoveries, we can look back at our previous slide and ask, is there in fact, um, are there controls to these claims. Do I know, say, uh, similar locations where uh, the number of shipwrecks or the number of plane disappearances can be compared? Um, that would be another, another example of something that we would look for a control so that we could assess those numbers. Um, in this case, you know, again, vague terms, um, only generalities, and ballpark uh, claims at this point, you would be able to only say that Bermuda Triangle is pseudoscientific. 
Now, could the Bermuda Triangle be scientifically validated? The answer is absolutely. Um, but you need some significant data. And if you want something to be considered scientific, you need to be able to follow all those things over on the far left. And without it, you have to only say, well, we have some scientific evidence or in this case, maybe no scientific evidence to support this claim. You would put that pseudoscientific idea as a belief, but it's not really science. All right, I hope that's helpful, and I will be back again soon.